Okay, so we are rounding the corner. We've started out the year in a series called What is the Church? We're in a unique position as a church because we do kind of lots of things. We meet here in public for a bigger setup, bigger songs and worship, and bigger area for a kids' room. And then other times we meet in our homes and have more uh, intimate gatherings together and services. And so we realize because that's different than how a lot of churches do it, we're trying to go, what does it really look like? What do the scriptures call us to be as the church? And how do we fit that here in our local expression in Studio City and through Anthology Church? So we are rounding the corner in this series. We spent the first half looking at who we are and our identity that the scriptures say we are. And now we are shifting to what we do. And that's probably what most people think about when they think about what is a church? What does a church do? What is the purpose of a church? And so that's what we're shifting into. Uh, two weeks ago, we looked at Acts 2, the very beginning, the earliest church there was, and we saw the earliest church was devoted to four things. Those four things they were devoted to were the scriptures, fellowship and community with one another, breaking bread, actual physical meals and bread with one another, and celebrating communion together, and lastly, prayer very simple. There were many other things that the early church did. There are many things that we as a church do, but they devoted themselves, Acts says, to those four things. And so we are spending time looking at all four of those things. Today we're going to look at the first two. We're going to look at the scriptures and to community or fellowship. And then two weeks we'll look at the last two together, which will bring us into Palm Sunday and Easter after that. So here's the key takeaway this morning. We're going to do it before we get into the scripture. This is the main thing to take away from this message. It's on the back of your bulletin right down here under notes if you want to take it home so you don't have to copy it um, as well. And so this, let me read that for us and then we'll get started. Key takeaway today, in the scriptures, the church has an absolutely trustworthy source for all we need for life and godliness. In community, we commit ourselves to gathering together regularly around the scriptures and obedience to Jesus. I'll read it one more time, pretty simple this morning. In the scriptures, the church has an absolutely trustworthy source for all we need for life and godliness. And in community, we commit ourselves to gather together regularly around those scriptures and obedience to Jesus. Let's start with the verses today that we'll focus on the scripture part. And then we'll get to that Hebrews passage when we talk about community. So 2 Timothy 3, 14 through 17 is what we are looking at for the scripture section. There should be a link at the bottom of your bulletin if you want to follow along on the phone or, or your tablet or whatever you might have with you. Or there are Bibles on the table you can pick up. 2 Timothy is about towards the back, uh, so at least three-fourths of the way uh, through the Bible. And hopefully you can find it. 2 Timothy is after 1 Timothy. They make it really easy that way, so hopefully you can find it. But it'll be right behind me. If not, 2 Timothy 3, 14 through 17, the Apostle Paul says to his protege, Timothy, but as for you, Timothy, continue in what you have learned and have firmly believed, knowing from whom you learned it and how from childhood you have been acquainted with the sacred writings, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. All scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. This is the word of the Lord. Well, when we look at the overall big picture of the American church today, it's easy probably to see a lot of problems. You could look at our own little church here at Anthology and probably say the same thing. It's not hard to see where we often fall short together in the mistakes and the sins that we have. Two weeks ago when we started this section out in Acts 2, I wondered out loud what the earliest Christians would think if they were kind of come forward, fast forward 2,000 years into the future and avoid all the technology stuff that would confuse them. But look into and see, Do would they say we as an American church have the same priorities the Lord Jesus passed on to them after he died and rose from the dead? But despite 
any failures the larger quote unquote American church may have, or despite any failures or shortcomings that we as our small church and anthology may have, there is still something that makes everything we do worth it in some degree, no matter our faults, no matter our other problems. There is something inside of us that makes us different than every other religious faith gathering that may be around us and every other gather, gathering of any people for any reason. There are all sorts of reasons people gather, right? Concerts, sporting events, um, you know, community gatherings and events. We do tons of kids' sports stuff, so there's all that going on and lots of kids' things. I went out to, we got, uh, there's a great, one of our favorite desserts that the Jenkins family is a churro place out in Sherman Oaks called Happy Days Cafe, and they do amazing churros. And I was out walking along Ventura Boulevard, saw tons of people gathering for all sorts of reasons, on dates, with friends, all sorts. There are all kinds of gatherings that people have. But there is something that we have as part of the body of Christ that should encourage us to never give up. Because there's ultimately no other place to find a group of people committed to this thing. It's a secret weapon, if you will. It is a treasure. It is a priceless pearl, something you can invest in, in which the return will always, always be worth it. What is that thing? What does the church have, including our little church, that no other religious gathering and no other gathering, no sporting event or kids event or political gathering or community gathering of any type can have, despite whatever high or low numbers other people may be a part of in whatever groups. It's the word of God himself speaking to people today. It's what Christians and what Paul here calls the scriptures or sacred writings. It's the God of the universe who made you and made me communicating through authors thousands of years ago into our very hearts today, living and active and telling us and telling anyone who hears the Bible preached or read in a church setting, a small group setting, or any other place, teaching us what's true, what's right, what's beautiful, what's just, what every human heart actually needs, what's really wrong with the world, what actually makes the world right, and what hopeful future lies before us. Yes, you can read your Bible on your own, and it's a course available in tons of places. The, the amount of access we have to the Bible today is incredible to help us read it, understand it, and things. And you can do that on your own. You can read it with your family. You can read it with your friends. And I would encourage you, Pastor DJ up here saying, I encourage you to read the Bible in any way that you can. However, there is no other community of people who are committed to one another, or hopefully committed to one another, like the church, where we're also committed and devoting ourselves to that Word of God as our ultimate foundation. Lots of other groups may have all kinds of other foundations. Only the church has the Scripture, has the Word of God, or should, as its firm foundation from which we get are everything. And there is nothing like the scriptures, I believe, in our world today. How do I know that? How do I know there's nothing else like it? Well, look again with me at what the Apostle Paul says here about the scriptures in a short address to a young protege of his, a young pastor in training and development uh, named Timothy that he writes this letter to. It's in, this section is extremely instructive on the role that Scripture is meant to play in both your life and in the life of our church and any church. Look how in verse 15, Paul says this to Timothy. How from childhood you, Timothy, have been acquainted with the sacred writings which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith Christ Jesus. Now, this, of course, is a very personal address that Paul is making to just Timothy, but it's included in our scriptures because it's so instructive 
for everyone else. But what Paul says to Timothy helps us all. Paul reminds Timothy that he came to faith. We learn in other parts of the letters that he came to faith through his mother and grandmother, teaching him. But teaching him from what? Teaching him from the scriptures, the sacred writings, Paul says. Notice it wasn't his mother and grandmother who made him, it wasn't them who made him wise for salvation. It was the scriptures themselves, the sacred writings, Paul says, that made Timothy wise for salvation. Paul says in Romans that faith in Jesus comes from hearing. Hearing what? Hearing the word of God. The first reason the church should be devoted, not just committed to, not just a part of what they do, not just reading a little scripture and making sure it's printed on your bulletin and makes you happy and feel nice inside, but devoted to as everything we do. The first reason is because the scriptures alone can make a person wise for salvation. The scriptures bring faith in Jesus. And faith in Jesus is what saves and forgives and transforms and takes away our shame and takes away our guilt and gives us hope for the future. That's ultimately what it's all about. That's what every person wants to some degree, right? It's not egg hunts and brunches that make one wise for salvation. It's not amazing analogies flashy services, great decorations that make one wise for salvation. It's not great friendships or kind deeds which make one wise for salvation. All those things, hear me, are very, very good. We're going to spend a lot of money that others have given to us, but we're still going to spend a lot of money for our Easter gathering in a month and the event afterwards We spend a lot of time talking about friendships and hanging out and potlucks and Oscar parties and things like that in our church. But the seed of what brings faith, the very thing that waters that faith, that can bring change, that can bring a person to put their trust and faith in Jesus is the Word of God alone. It's the Bible. Paul's telling Timothy and us today, the weapon, if you will, to blow up the heart and cause it to turn away from ourselves to save ourselves, away from ourselves to put our trust and our hope in ourselves, away from ourselves to put our trust and hope ultimately in anything else out in the world. The weapon that blows up our hearts, turns us from ourselves, turns us to Jesus for salvation is the Bible. It's so simple. Why then would we be devoted to anything else to accomplish that purpose? Nothing else can make a person, young, old, man, woman, black, white, and anything in between, wise for salvation than the Bible itself. But it doesn't just bring people to faith in Jesus in the beginning. The scriptures do even more. Look at verse 16. Paul says, all scripture is breathed out by God. It's profitable for teaching, reproof, correction, training in righteousness. This is a great verse to commit to memory, right? This is a great, you go, why, do I, why am I reading this Bible again? I don't really feel like reading the Bible and I'm, you know, kind of what, I, this is a great verse to remind yourself, and go, oh yeah, that's right. This, this is God speaking to me. This turn of phrase by Paul is wonderful, isn't it? Yes, the scriptures make us wise for salvation because they are the very breath of God itself. The Bible you hold in your hands or read on your phone, (laughs) increasingly now today, with a screen or the screen behind me or here in an audio book or in every other way you hear the Bible or read it. That thing is the very breath of God. It is God breathed, speaking to the world what is true. It proceeds from Him. Just like all your words have to come ultimately from your lungs and come out through your vocal cords, but you need air. You have to take a deep breath every time that you 
say something. Paul is saying, every time you read the scriptures, I, God is speaking, inhaling divine words, divine insight, divine love, divine grace, and speaking it to the world. So every time you read the Gospels, the Epistles, any other letters, the Psalms, the Torah, the Prophets, the Writings, the Proverbs, and on and on and on, anytime you read those, you are reading the very breath of God spoken to you. So, again, they're able to make us wise for salvation. They are the breath of God. But then the scriptures don't just bring us to salvation. They help us grow in every way after we come to know Jesus. Notice Paul again says they're profitable for teaching, reproof, correction, training in righteousness. They teach us. They change us if you are a follower, committed follower of Jesus. They point us to our sin. They point us to our need to change. They train us to walk with God and to know Him, to care about what He cares about, and to love people as He loves people, and to see people as He sees people, and to do as He did. They are our spiritual fitness guru, if you will. The scriptures are our guide. They're much, it's much less expensive for that guide than uh, actual spiritual gurus in Los Angeles, of course, if you get a personal trainer. Any church should devote themselves to the scriptures because they are the very way that followers of Jesus grow and repent and change. Sometimes it's really simple. A lot of people who want to follow Jesus, who've committed to being Christian, sometimes ask, how can I grow? One of the first answers, probably the first answer we should give is the Bible. <laughs> Knowing it, reading it, ingesting it, studying it with others, in big group settings, studying it in small group settings, applying it to your life, memorizing it and taking it into your heart, that should probably be the best and first answer we give for how someone can grow in their faith. God uses the Bible to save. God uses the Bible to change. God uses the Bible to mold and shape us. God uses the Bible to train us. So should His church which is why that's the first thing that we need to be devoted to when we think about what we do. Aren't we all concerned nowadays with massive amounts of misinformation out there? Isn't it so confusing? At least it feels this way in my lifetime to think about what is actually true and who is telling me the truth in the media, on the news, in this thing I read, on the internet, in this thing my friend is telling me that they know for sure is true. It is really hard in the midst of media, online, uh, deep fakes, if you know what that is. Now our computers are getting so good that they can take you know, images and videos of people and make it look like someone is saying something they're not saying. ChatGPT is uh, really smart, if you know what that is. It's a little freaky how good computers are becoming. Science, everyone says, this is what the science says, but no, actually, this is what the science... It is very hard nowadays to know what is true. Then there are many people, of course, who are lying to us for profit and conspiracy and for country or whatever other reason they may have. It's hard to know what's true nowadays. That is never, ever the case when we spend time in the Bible. We can know it's true. We know it saves. or God saves through it. We know God uses it to change us. It is a treasure that we should devote ourselves to. Second one, second devotion that's not as long as the first that we saw the early church had after the scriptures is community. If a church group is all kinds of committed to the Bible, to reading it, to studying it, to being in it, and letting it shape our church, but that community never gathers together around those scriptures there is no chance for those scriptures to play their role in shaping and training and molding and saving. And people can remain unchanged and unsaved 
That's why this second devotion is so important. Community, a.k.a. fellowship, however you want to call it. Look again at Hebrews 10, 23 through 25. It's what we read in our scripture reading. It's such a good one. Look at the emphasis, the author. We don't know the author of Hebrews. Lots of people have different uh, debates about who it might be, but the author makes a point to, in this passage, show how communal it is. Let me read it for you with those emphases. Verse 23, let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering. For he, Jesus, who promised is faithful, and let us consider how to stir one another to love and good works, not neglecting to meet together, as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another and all the more as you all, that's a plural you, which is why put it in there, as you all see the day drawing near. You cannot read this passage that comes at the end of a great long discussion on, from the Hebrews author on the supremacy supremacy of Jesus and his work, moving into how we live it out in this section in the good news here. You cannot read this section and go, hey, this is clearly something I can totally do by myself and on my own, just me and Jesus. I don't need anyone else. You can't read this. This this section of scripture makes no sense if you are kind of a lone wolf Christian just doing it on your own. He says, let us, our hope, let us, one another, together, one another, you all. It's just so clear here. Why does community or fellowship matter so much for a church, because you cannot obey Jesus and all he said on your own. We have to remember this today, right? Because our culture tends to be very individualistic. We tend to think about just me and my life, and I'm going to get mine, and I'm going to do my thing. It's so easy to depend on ourselves, and it's so easy to become isolated with things like everything on the internet nowadays. And there's tons of resources from all kinds of churches. So you're tempted to think, gosh, it's, it's hard, it's awkward sometimes to get up and go to church or go to this community of people. It's a lot easier for me to sit at home. I don't have to dress up. <laughs> it's uncomfortable to do whatever. And it can just be easy and tempting to think I can just do it on my own and avoid all those hard things. But Jesus here in the Scriptures are telling us you can't do it on your own. Jesus designed us and designed his church for community with one another, for being together, for studying the scriptures together, for encouraging each other together, for holding fast and clinging to Jesus as we hold on to each other. We are meant, the author says, to stir others up to love and good works not just stir yourself up. You're meant to be stirred up by others. You need need to be stirred up. You need to be encouraged. You need them and they need you. The confession of faith in Jesus is not just your hope if you're following Jesus. The author here says it's our hope. It's not just your personal hope, it is our hope together. It's not just your personal faith, it's not just your personal Jesus. You're linked to the church. You're linked to community. You need and are designed for fellowship with other believers and those who are exploring what it looks like to follow Jesus. Now I know, as well as you, it is hard to gather a lot of times, right? Sometimes you wake up on Sundays and you are very tired. Anyone got to get an amen for, for that? Sometimes they change the clocks on you and it messes up your whole timing and you don't know when you're supposed to go to church. Sometimes you may have a conflict with someone else in church. Sometimes you may have other members of your household that don't want to go and you feel like you're dragging others along. Sometimes you just might not feel like it. A lot of times that's true of all of us. It's true of me a lot. Sometimes a small group is hard and awkward to be in and you're in someone else's home and you don't know everyone and it takes time. Sometimes you don't feel like sharing a meal or buying something and bringing it. 
Sometimes you don't want to serve. Sometimes, maybe all the time, it's just easier to, easier to pop up Netflix or pull out TikTok. We have no lack of entertainment waiting for us, right? It is so easy to escape and spend hours and hours and hours by yourself doing whatever because there's so much access at our fingers. But those things can never give you the hope you truly need to be reminded of. Those things don't center around the eternity-altering God who speaks to people in the Scriptures, which can make you wise for salvation, can mold and shape and change your heart for eternity, can give you a hope and a future, can give you a belonging. One of the things I saw a pastor friend of mine post this on uh Twitter, and he said, do you think modern people don't like preaching? Just watch the Oscars tomorrow night. There will probably be a lot of speeches, a lot of people saying, here's what life should be about. But every person is looking for belonging, for hope, for a way to change, for a way to be who they are supposed to be, for love and goodness and acceptance. The scriptures speak to us of that God who brings all that. And all those other things outside of that, all those other things are not going to be able to bring what we ultimately need. We need to be stirred up to love and good deeds and faith. And that's not ultimately going to become, come from being stirred up by a Netflix series or 40 minutes on TikTok or Fox News or CNN or The Office or as much as I love it, The Mandalorian or The Bachelor, or whatever other favorite show of yours you can insert. Those things aren't going to help you, most likely, hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering. But gathering with your church body can do all of those things. Sharing a meal with others in faith, celebrating communion, giving a hug to someone in need, going through a hard time, getting a hug from someone else because you are going through a hard time, reminding and remembering with others what Jesus has done for you, singing his goodness even if you don't feel like it in the moment. All those things will shape you profoundly over time into the person you want to be. Community never happens overnight takes a good amount of time with others, but it will come if you give yourself to God in it. Notice also, this strikes me as a little funny. 2,000 years ago, they had the same problem we do, even without all the modern stuff. Look at verses 24 and 25. Let us consider how to stir one another up uh, to love and good works. And verse 25, not neglecting to meet together as is the habit of some. <laughs> See, the author seems to be just a little bit of like a little, 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 little stab in the corner of like, you know, we all know those people who are not coming to church nowadays, as is the habit of some. It just makes me laugh. But even back then, 2,000 years ago, without all modern stuff, there were still some people who were like, man, it's really hard to go to church. <laughs> it's really hard to get together with everyone else. They're apparently Christians even back then. Uh, who it was hard to make a habit and were neglecting to meet together with other saints, to break bread together, to worship together, to celebrate communion. And so he needed to encourage them how much more in our modern world, with as busy as we are as Angelinos, as much access we have to everything, do we need to be reminded where we truly have change and hope and where and what community can do for us. I want to close with a final reminder from this scripture about why we should make it our ambition to be devoted as believers, why Anthology Church should make it our ambition to be devoted to scriptures and community in particular here. The author says we are to be encouraging one another all the more as you all see the day drawing near. The word day there is capitalized because it's clear the author is referring to an incredible important event that's gonna happen in the future and it's still going to happen in the future from our own day. What day, capital D, is this? He's got to be referring to Jesus returning. We need to encourage one another and devote ourselves to the Scriptures and gather together because one day, Jesus really is going to come back. 
It's nearer today than it was when the author of Hebrews wrote these words. It's nearer today than when you woke up this morning. It's nearer than when the Apostle Paul spoke these things to Timothy. It's nearer every second that passes. He truly is going to return. That's We sang it in the first song there together. And when he does, everything in your life will be made clear. Everything that's murky now and confusing now will no longer be. That means every investment that you make in the Scriptures on your own and together with other people will be shown to have an ultimate worth and value for all of eternity. And every time in faith you gathered with other believers to encourage them and worship Jesus and be encouraged yourself and encourage a brother or a sister and hear the word of God and remember his love and try to walk in faith with others and try to serve your community and try to do good, all that will be shown to be an incredible investment worth all your time when he returns. It's hard to see it all now but then it will all be made clear. So let's press on, Anthology Church, whether you're here or online. Let's devote ourselves to the Scriptures together. Let's encourage one another all the more until the day Jesus returns. Let's pray. Lord, thank you so much. It is uh, encouraging for me to be reminded that even 2,000 years ago, <laughs> it was hard sometimes together and there are so many things going on in our lives we modern people especially as angelinos our lives are so busy and we have so many distractions it can be so hard to be focused and remember what is true and it's one of the reasons we need you god we need constant reminders weekly daily together when we're on our own of what's actually true of what we actually need of what's really wrong with us of what's really wrong with the world, of what really puts the world right, of what you really accomplished for us, Jesus, in your death and resurrection, of how much you really love us and love this world and are calling people to follow you, of how much you've really forgiven us, of how much you've really given us a home and a hope and forever goodness, and of how much we really need to gather together and be together to remember that. Help us, Lord, to remember those things. Help us, like the early church, to be devoted to it as you taught us to be. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.